Honorable Dr. Karan Singh, Dr. Suleiman Singh, Dr. Naman Ahuja, Dr. Ashya Sethi, Dr. Suresh Goyal and friends. I, on behalf of Legends of India, welcome you to another episode of Shanta Saradit Singh Art Appreciation Lecture. For those who are new here this evening, I take this opportunity to introduce Legends of India, a society trying to preserve the traditions of Indian cultural heritage for the younger generation. I will strongly believe that unless our great art forms are recognized and involved with the education process, they will shrink and become mere showpieces in the present socio-economic situation. We need to infuse in the younger generation the greatness and importance of our rich cultural heritage. During the past 17 years, we have organized music, theatre festivals, art exhibitions in Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, Bangalore. Our endeavor has always been about young upcoming talents to share the platform with the established legends. In the recent past, we introduced Morning Ravas for the inmates at Tihar and later brought it to public domain. Though the crowning event of all our activities have been, has been Legends of India Lifetime Achievements Award that was first established in 2002 and has since then gained national renown and appreciation from the cultural community. Some of the past awardees have been Zora Cycle, Habib Tanvi, Chandra Lekha, Buddha Dev Das Gupta, Girja Devi, Sitara Devi, Badal Sarkar, Imad Shah, to mention a few. This year, the selection committee has been chaired by Sri Lalit Man Singh. The awardees in the award ceremony will soon be announced. The Art Appreciation Lecture series was initially conceptualized by Shantar, Shantar Sarabhi Singh, and therefore we named this series in her memory. And now, with the help of Dr. Suresh Goel, we are taking it forward. We are genuinely grateful for his perseverance, hard work, and commitment. Thank you. I require perseverance. Today's topic, spirituality and secularism in Indian art forms. No single English word has perhaps created more controversy over the meaning, interpretation and application, particularly in the Indian context, than the term secular. No less mysterious is often used term spiritual. In the Indian context, secularism instead of suggesting dharma nirpeksha has interpreted to imply sarva dharma sambhavana, the equal feeling towards all religions, sambhav. Now the questions are, can we synergize secularism and spirituality? Is there any symbolic relationship between the two? Are these two concepts aggressive? Is it possible to integrate spirituality and secularism in India? And if so, what are the fundamentals? We'll hear it from the speakers. I take this opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Karan Singh, who needs no introduction perhaps, and my special gratitude towards him for being for agreeing to be as be among us. A politician, a philanthropist, a poet and poet. He has been a member of the Rajya Sabha and President of ICCR. Thank you, sir, for being with us. We eagerly look forward to hearing you. Our panel, Dr. Sonal Man Singh, cultural educationist of international repute. She is the recipient of the highest civilian awards, the Padma Vibhushan and Padma Bhushan, among many others coveted national and international honours. Sonalji is very special to Legends of India as we have had a long association with her. She has performed for Legends of India in Delhi, Mumbai and Kolkata. Dr. Naman Ahuja, he has been our panelist earlier, he is a curator of Indian art, professor of J Jawaharlal Nehru University, most noted of his critically acclaimed exhibition, The Body in Indian Art and Thought, shown in Brussels and the National Museum in, in Delhi. Dr. Arshya Sethi, Twice Fulbright Fellow is, a, is an independent scholar and consultant of arts and cultural institutions. She has been a part of the project team for several tangible and intangible 
cultural properties, including India Abidjan Center, where she remained as creative head for a decade. She has been the advisor of, of, of Doordarshan and danced in it with the Times of India. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now request Dr. Boy to take over. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Japan. Uh, I must confess uh, that with this eminent panel here, uh, if I say anything at all about the subject, uh, it probably will be considered But I thought that let me just take a few minutes and to explain what was in my mind when I thought of this subject for a discussion and how I happened to then request uh, the, uh, the keynote speaker and the panelists. I took liberties because of my earlier request with them and they very kindly agreed to my request. But uh, I was just going over the word secularism some time ago and then I came across this book by Mr. Puri which is actually quite a book talking only about secularism and then it says there that secularism dates back to 1846 and it means, and this is actually very interesting, it means the doctrine that morality should be used solely as regard to well-being of mankind in the, pers in the present life uh, to the exclusion of all considerations drawn from belief in God or in a future state. I think it's a statement which, if, which could confuse, but I think it's a very articulate statement in terms of defining what secularism should be really. And for me, when I read this statement, it reminded me of the Shloka, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santu Niramaya. That Shloka actually then epitomizes what secularism is. And then that brought me to think, uh, is secularism that we talk about uh, in India, and for me, the association of India is really the Indian civilizational values, which is depicted in the arts, not just the physical form of art, but the art traditions, intangible traditions which actually pass on in the vocal forms, etc. Vedas is part of that, Ved is part of that heritage. So uh, then I thought that basically the secularism, if that is what it means, is not really new to India, it is not a Western concept. Secularism has been there with us from the Vedic times. Uh, and then because I had always thought of uh, our civilizational values really associating with spirituality. So in my mind, I formed an association between the secularism and the spirituality. And for me personally, I have always considered spirituality as the unison of body, mind, and the intellect to achieve a total bliss uh, or understanding of the self and the universe, self and others in relationship with each other. As they say that, ahamasmi tattvamasi. So we have always believed in that kind of relationship between I and you, self and the others. And that is for me what spirituality means. So that is when I thought that really it could be a good idea to explore by people who know more about the subject than I would and to understand what really it means whether Indian arts or the Indian civilization, how have the spirituality and secularism come together? Uh, for example, again, talking about the Vedic times, uh, in secularism has been again explained basically the essential elements as intellectual courage, toleration towards others, emphasis on truth, universalism, and service to humanity. So you look at all these things and these have been part of our cultural value system since ancient times really. So there we are. Uh, I'm not going to say anything further really. Uh, that idea that occurred to me a long time ago to explore what actually secularism all really means now is in the hands and, and it's a, uh, spirituality. 
within the hands of the eminent speakers here? Shunalji, Naman Ahuja, Arshya Sethi, Suresh Goel, Nandipayan Majumdar, Legends of India. Let me first of all commend the Legends of India for the work that they have been doing after over many years. I have had occasion earlier also to interact with some of their functions. And I am very glad that they are committed to reintroducing and reinterpreting our great cultural heritage for younger generations. Another organization which I happen to head also, uh, Spik Maki, they have done outstanding work in this, outstanding work over the last. So it is very important that civil society should rise to the occasion because government cannot do that. We do say always that arts and culture should be involved in our educational system, but nobody has really come up with any concrete or acceptable formulation. So it's very important that private organizations, civil societies should uh, do that and I'd like to congratulate the religions of India for that. But before I say anything else, I want to uh, pay homage to Shanta Sarabji after whom this function is being created. Uh, she was really a remarkable woman. I remember uh, 60 years ago, uh, I first came into touch with Sarabji and Shanta when I was still Sarabji Riyasat up in Jammu and Kashmir. When he was making those isometric maps and taking those extraordinary photographs from the air and then converting them into paintings. I mean, his Himalayan paintings, I think, are absolutely striking and brilliant. So um, I remember him very well and Shanta, in her own right, was a great patron of the arts. She, she did a lot to develop and to encourage uh, the cultural scene in the capital. I remember even when she was very ill the last time there was a function here in, in, the, in the auditorium. She was there in a wheelchair, although she was, she was very ill, but she was there till the end. And she was a remarkable woman. She did a lot to help and encourage younger artists. Uh, and uh, I would like to pay my homage to her memory because uh, these lectures are in her, in her name. Now, for the, for the definitions, you know, I'm not going to get into a long discourse on the meaning of secularism. Suresh has come out with some rather far-fetched and far-out theories about what secularism means, which I had never heard before, frankly. Because as I understood it, secularism meant when Henry VIII wanted to marry his sixth or eighth or whatever wife he wanted to marry, and the, and the, uh, the Pope wouldn't give him a divorce, he said, out with you. I'm going to start my own church. So from then on, you know, the church and the state. Luckily, we've never had a church in this country. We've had churches, of which we are proud, but we've never had a church. And therefore, I think that uh, to, to, to link uh, secularism with the Veda and all is very, very far fetched. But I don't want to get into that philosophical argument. Because one can, if you take secularism as Sarva Dharma Samabhava, equal respect for all religions, then yes. Certainly, if that is, it depends on definitions. For example, you go back to the Rig Veda, Ekam Sat Vipra Bhavuda Vadanti. The truth is one, the wise call it by many names. That is the keynote of the interface movement. But whether the interface movement is a secular movement or not, I would not say. Because secularism, as I understand it, is tends to be anti-religious. Doesn't have to be, but tends to be, particularly with uh, the, the left-oriented uh, intellectuals. So I'm not going to get, go into this uh, uh, definition of secularism. As far as I'm concerned, and, and spirituality also. Now, what is spirituality? What is the difference? This is not a philosophical seminar today. Uh, it, it, is, it, is a, it is a seminar or meeting revolving around the performing arts. So as far as I understand, for me, spirituality here would mean religion. Secularism would mean non-religion. I mean, that may be a very crude way of putting it, but I think that's what we want. If we want to make any sense of this of this subject, we have to be clear about our definitions. So that was the def those are the definitions of which, of which I am going to uh, uh, say a few words. May not Everybody may not agree with that. First of all, uh, it says spirituality in Indian arts. So arts, I presume, include the performing arts, they include dance, they include music, they include sculpture, paintings, and so on. I would say that uh, almost all our art forms have been very, very deeply influenced by religion. Whether it was Bharatanatyam, which began in the 
uh, in the Shiva temples in South India, or whether it is uh, Odishi. We have one of the great exponents here, Kathak, or Kathakali, or Kuchipudi, or Mohiniyattam, Mohiniyattam, all of them, all of them can trace their beginning to the religious impulse, to one or other of the deities. For example, Manipuri. Manipur is entirely a Vaishnava dance. So you cannot uh, uh, cut away the, the, the dance uh, traditions from religion in the name of secularism. I think that would be an extremely wrong thing to do. And I, I would very strongly oppose that. Because unless, if somebody is uh, uh, dancing Natana Marina, for example, unless you have a, a thing of Shiva, how will you appreciate the dance? O Krishnani, Bhagani. Uh, you know, unless you have a Krishna, you, can, you cannot appreciate it. So I think it's very important that we understand the religious, and I use the word without without any uh, uh, sort of hesitation. Without any people say you should you say religion, you are you are yourself you are you are anti secular. It's not true. They're totally different worlds. So I would say that all our arts, almost all our arts, uh, uh, have very strong religious roots. I think uh, we can go into that in great detail. Uh, oh, our, and, and religious daughter does not necessarily mean Hindu. For example, we have the great South Indian temples, great Hindu temples, you know, the Tanjavur and the Dhirubhanamalai and Chidambaram and Sri Rangam and Madurai Vinakshi, great temples. Then you have the Ajanta Alora Kiyos, which are Buddhist. They are all revolving around Buddhism. Without Buddhism, without Buddha, where would our art be? Without Shiva, where would our art be, for God's sake? Nitya Vasane Natara Jaraj Vanara Dhakkam Naupanchavaram Uddhartu Kamaan Sarakadi Siddhan Yetatri Marshayashi Sutraja The Nataraja, one of the great creations of, of, uh, of Indian culture and civilization, I think is one of the great artifacts in world, world art. So on the one hand you have the kinetic image of the Nataraja, and on the other hand, you have the extraordinary image of the Buddha sunk in deep meditation. And both are deeply spiritual. One is movement, the other is silence. So between these two poles, between the poles of the Sarnath Buddha and the, uh, and the Natarajas of Chidambaram, you find the whole gamut of Indian sculpture. The temples, for example, as I was saying, they were Ijanta, Ranakpur. One of the most beautiful temples in India, underestimated, I think, in its own way, is as beautiful as the Taj Mahal. Because it's not so well known, the Jain temple uh, in Ranakpur. So, we, all our traditions, uh, all our religious traditions here, yeah, whether it is the Hindu tradition, which you, if you like, you can call it the mainstream tradition, whether the Buddhist tradition, whether the Jain tradition, all those traditions have deeply influenced our art. And they are all religion. And religion, to my mind, ultimately will lead to spirituality. So that's one point uh, I would like to make very clearly. Now, painting uh, of the, over the last, let us say, what, seven or eight decades has moved away from religion. The, the, the modern art movements, you know, the, whether it is the uh, pro progressive artist movement or the Bermuda School or the, or, or the, uh, the Bengal School, no? they gradually moved away from religion and they have become to use uh, Suresh's terms, they become secular in the sense that they no longer revolve around deities, which is fair enough. I'm not, I'm not making a value judgment here. I'm just trying to point out, for example, you have uh, uh, Pahari paintings of Darbars, of the Rajas. That is secular in a way. It's not, it's not religious. The, not all the paintings are devoted to a deity. They can be devoted to a uh, uh, Ramavamsa Sudhavata Chandra, you know, the, uh, Raja Raja Shola, whatever. So, but painting has, has moved, I think, a great deal away from that. And particularly modern painting has, has gone totally away from religion, which is good in a way because new impulses have come in. Although there are still people like, for example, Santosh with his tantric paintings and other, other painters who have been involved, even Raza with his extraordinary uh, paintings. The Bindu, the Bindu itself, as it were, is a symbol of the, of the creativity that is to be found in, 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 uh, in, our, in our art. So I think paintings tend to move away, which is all right, I have nothing against that. Uh, modern art needs uh, a little more effort to understand 
But of course, there's some terrible modern art also. I think it's terrible. I find it ghastly modern art. And then there's some great modern art. But the religious art, at least, I think is very much better, frankly. And I'm going to go on now to the last point that I'm going to make. That what, what about beauty? There was a seminar, if you remember, I think, Swanaji, you were there or not, in, in the International Center, is beauty still necessary? So I said, for God's sake, if beauty is not there, in, our, our tradition is satyam shivam sundar. It should be true, it should be auspicious, it should be beautiful. So without satyam shivam sundaram, for example, if somebody were to give me Gyarnika as a gift, or the scream as a gift, I'd never have it anywhere nearby. These are terrible paintings. They're, they're disturbing paintings. They, they are sort of uh, frightful objects. They're great paintings. I'm not saying that they're not. For example, I much prefer Salvador Dali to, uh, to um, what's his name? The Gurdjieff to, to Pablo Picasso. I think Dali was a genius. Not only with his weird thing, but some the landing of Columbus in America. Or Dali's crucifixion. I don't know whether you've seen it or not. How the bodies, they have the spheres like that and the body. It's a great painting. Dali's last, last, that would be last dinner. You know, they, you have the one in Milano, which is the Leonardo da Vinci one. But you have the last dinner there by, by, by Dali. Last supper, sir. Not the last dinner, last supper. And so, you know, I think Dali is much nicer because he's, there's some beauty in it. There's a painting for the screen. I have no desire to see somebody scream. However, let me say that uh, uh, my uh, good friend Naman is here. He did this. Uh, he did this. Uh, I'm going to He did this exhibition for me uh, when I was in ICCR in, uh, in Belgium, which was a great the body in Indian art. And I said, you know, Naman, there's not enough beauty. You've got skeletons and weird things. You know, where is the beauty, for God's sake? How can you have Indian art without beauty? No, no, he thinks I'm terribly old fashioned and reactionary. Kahani beauty. Kya baat hai kar rahe hai ye feudal attitude. Beauty is not a feudal attitude. I read your mind. I read your mind on that. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> So I said, no, I'm sorry. So, very Muslims say, Khinj Khanski, Nindite Kar Kar Ke, Ek Nataraj Bane Vahad Allah. Very Muslims. I mean, if I was making a thing, I'd start with the Nataraj and end with the Nataraj. No, not for the modern art. Modern art has got to be this, you've got to be this. You've got to cut everything up into pieces and you disaggregate the human body. Fair enough, if you want to do it, if it gives you satisfaction, do it. It doesn't give me satisfaction. I'm going to end, therefore, finally, with <laughs> two lines from Sri Aurobindo. All music is only the sound of his laughter. All beauty, the smile of his passion and bliss. Thank you. Uh, I don't comment on that right away. I think it's better that we have the other panelists come up with their own points of view before we start talking and before we start Having a discussion. So the next one, uh, Naman, uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Then the first thing is well, thank you all very much for having me here. Um, I want to pay my respects to Shanta Sarjit Singh. Um, Shanta, she was an extraordinary woman, steely, um, but also incredibly graceful and I've known her my entire life and it's um, as I matured into an art historian at some point I remember our conversations became more serious and at some point issues came around that why is it that when it comes to all other arts painters particularly, or sculptors, as you said, we like them to break from tradition and to be innovators. Our critics laud them for that. But dare a dancer or a musician break from tradition, she is hauled over the coals and there isn't a space for it. The gallery only wants breakers from tradition and the stage only wants upholders of it. And when that kind of a binary begins to emerge, 
where you only start saying, Are, you know, the person's repertoire is just like his guru and his ustad, and he sings just like his ustad, and it is upholding a karana, is considered far preferable to somebody who is smashing it. And, and then this becomes uh, a cause for concern because we don't necessarily have the critical apparatus to be able to assess it. Because even breaking, like every modern painter knew, like a Picasso or anyone, had to be somebody who was utterly steeped in the tradition first in order to be able to know how to break from it. So all modern art, sir, is not merely a matter of being, of just trying to be destructive for the sake of being shown, for the sake of showmanship. But it also comes sometimes out of an awareness and out of a, an effort to be able to communicate something. And after all, we come from a tradition where we believe that Bibhats has to be communicated along with Raudra has to be communicated along with Karuna and Shringara. And both all have to have their space. An art exhibition must therefore be able to give balance and to be able to bring <laughs> those things which are beautifully morbid or horrifyingly morbid, but that's beautiful too in its own way uh, in what it can evoke if it can transform, if it can touch. I think the conflicts between state and the instruments of upholding religion are perhaps a more productive space than when the state is aligned with religion. Because at least in one situation, you end up keeping the two matters separate. Art is something that is personal, and so is religion, and so they must remain in that sphere. Then there is the responsibility of what happens in the domain that is public. Putting matters that are personally felt onto your stage is hard work. Might be the prerogative of a dancer to be able to do so if she wishes to bear her soul. Must everyone? And then what room is there for her to maintain artifice, which is her prerogative, her preserve, if she is going to be autobiographical? Where is the dividing line that if you are not going to allow artifice to speak and move and sway your public imagination and convince them of your lies because you're brilliant at it, that's what we're there for. But if you're going to convince everyone because it is a heartfelt plea, and it is so moving and because it is utterly autobiographical that yourself has to be put on scrutiny and your linen washed, laundered on stage in public in every one of your performances, then you're making the pub private into public constantly in a way that you are not leaving any room for critical discourse. You don't need a, sh you don't need a critic then, you perhaps need a shrink to write about your performance. And then you're ending up with a very difficult set of confused, in a, a confused environment in which we find ourselves now. Where the reduction of intellectual thought and innovation in favor of slavish copying in the name of upholding tradition has taken over. Is Guru Parampara slavish? No, it need not be. In fact, it is the most respectful pedagogical method around. But there is a kind of demand for a continuity which is religiously, which is done religiously so. And so you end up in a situation where perfectly modern innovation that might be religiously inspired is always looked upon that it deserves preservation, not because it is a modern art form, not because it is a perfectly modern khayal singer, or not because it is a perfectly modern Bharatanatyam dancer, but because she is upholding a religiously sanctioned tradition. And therein lies a conflict for us. Are we patronizing her because she is upholding a religious tradition? Or are we patronizing her because she is a thoroughly modern dancer? 
And I think the dividing line between the two is that the, the problem is that we don't end up then congratulating her for the innovation of being the modern dancer, but we constantly reduce that intellectual thought and innovation to something which is an upholding of tradition. Temples are a funny place. Men are so spiritual, they used temples for Devadasis. Men are so spiritual, they use those temple dancers as prostitutes. But whether Kanchi or Kathua, temples have had a knack for being used for all kinds of negative actions, right? Time and again. And this is a curious bind that we find ourselves in, in this country, where religion has become the enforcer and preserver of art and of erotic art in particular. So if you wanted to write a history of Indian eroticism, you'd be hard pressed to do it outside the temple space. If you wanted to listen to the history of Indian erotic verse, you'd be hard pressed to find it outside of Sufi or Bhakti literature. So if it were not for the religious environment, you wouldn't have a preservation of the most erotic in the society. Now, putting the erotic and having the only sanctioned space for it within the confines of religion means that the, the instruments of the protection of the religion have to then also make provision for the, for the protection of those things that come with religion. And that again becomes a double bind because we imagine the upholder of religious tradition to be somebody who is upholding it in the name of a certain sanitized version that is appropriate for public behavior on a modern stage. So the modern conflation of state and religion is truly a double bind. Because neither is it able to do right by religion, nor is it able to do right by public space. And, and this is going to be a constant vortex that we're going to come up with again and again. Artists have had to disguise erotica in religion, and audiences have, have had nowhere else to seek it other than religion. I, I mean, I'm not going to talk much about it. I've just finished an op-ed in the New Mar on the matter, which is basically an entire issue about censorship in the arts and the space for eroticism within religion in India. And, but it does force one as a person of faith, personally, and somebody steeped in spiritual practice, it leaves one rather cold and alone and aware that personal faith, when allowed access, when allowed access to for political public purposes, stands corrupted and polluted and used such that it leaves the person fractured. What is art? Let's get back to basic definitions. That which provokes, which forces us to question ourselves, that which can cause such a transformation of the self that the great Kashmiri Pandits, sir, as you would remember, of the 8th to 10th century couldn't stop debating whether it was something spiritual or whether it was such a brilliant form of Maya that it left us confused between what is real and what is unreal. And on this old debate, like all Rasiks, I side with the Advaita Vadins. If art can bring me to empathy, to self-realization, to question what is unjust, if it can lead to transformation, then perhaps it is the same thing as something spiritual. Thank you. Thank you, Naman. I think uh, you are going to be followed by somebody who is a dancer, who has performed, and I think she is the best person to respond to your uh, statements about traditions not binding the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the visual artist for dancing the performance. So, I am not going to say too much here, please. Uh, you can speak from the people. Oh dear, difficult to 
I don't even want to match Naman's uh, JNU steeped expressions. I can't bring those phrases to play. But uh, I respected Dr. Karan Singh Ji, who always calls me Shonali, and he's allowed to call me that. And Deepayan ji and Suresh ji and Naman ji and Ashya ji and all of you ji's. Wonderful to be here. <coughs> uh, there, there, there was a, a message, uh, I think, written by I don't know who, I'll check it out, that um, uh, the art about Bhartanatyam. Uh, okay, one second, one second, one second. It's, it sort of generally says Bharatanatyam is a majoritarian art, uh, which is which doesn't belong to today's society, and so it, it starts from there. I mean, yeah, Bharatanatyam is a majoritarian art form, which does not belong to this society. Is that a JNU writer? No, I have to find out who wrote that. Maybe Sadanand or maybe whoever it is. Doesn't matter. So it's okay. Sab chalta hai. Well, I just want to first, uh, I wrote Asatoma Sadgamaya from untruth to the truth, Sat. Actually, Sat is not even truth. Truth is a very uh, truncated uh, expression. But here we are not here to translate these uh, foreign words. I'm here to uh, say that Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya from darkness of ignorance to the light, Prakash, enlightenment, knowledge. And Rityurma Amritam Gamaya from death to immortality. I'm sure we understand very well that we are not talking of, about us mortals. And death is an everyday occurrence in everybody's life here, there, everywhere. And to be immortal is to seek Prakash, Tejas, and to live in that Prakash. And for many, for many, many centuries and millennia, this kind of uh, enlightenment or the sphere of life, the space in which one can live, think, perform, share, act, has been ours in this country. We are very lucky. And um, it need not be only on stage, it need not be in temples. It is, as Navan said, religion or dharma. Dharma is better, but when you say religion, it, it sort of refers to a narrowed down version of what you believe in, who you believe in, whether you believe or not, whether you are astika or nastika. So all that I think I want to avoid. Long time ago in Trichur, in Kerala, after my series of performances, that was the last one, the previous day evening was at Guru Ayur, the temple, Guru and Vayu, where uh, Krishna had, um, uh, he had, he had been shot with the arrow of Jara and he had left his mortal body, mortal body of Krishna. And yet, there was, it was floating on the ocean. These are all beautiful, whether you believe in legends, it's a legend. If you believe in the reality, it's real. And uh, Guru, the Brihaspati, the teacher of gods, told Vayu to fly it and then deposit it on that spot where the temple of Guru Vayu Krishna has come up. Very beautiful. Next year was Trichur and at the end of it there was an interaction and a very, very, I was running to catch my train, a very simple lady in a fawn-colored nylon sari tightly wrapped around her roly-poly body and 
jasmines and a choti and uh, you know nose rings and all. She said one last question, madam. I was getting irritated, and she said, "Can you give me an example of any composition, any padam, any bhajan, anything at all, where usually?" And they were all these male composers, Kshetranya, Shama Shastri, the, the uh, Tanjur brothers, uh, and uh, so many, I forget, the Purandana Das and so many. And in the north also, Tulsi Das and Sur Das and everyone. Can you give me a single example of a male composer, writer, poet, who has expressed his love intensity to a goddess directly as his beloved. As his beloved, a direct approach. Rather than saying, O oh Radha, beloved of Krishna, O oh Parvati, the mother of Ganesh, or consort of Shiva, O oh Lakshmi, direct. And it really set my head rolling and I said, listen, I'm sorry, immediately I can't think of any because they are always addressing goddesses as you, O oh great goddess, O oh great mother, O oh consort of Shiva, O oh consort of Vishnu, etc. And I needed time. I came back and discussed it with Jeevan Paniji, my mentor, scholar, poet. And after one week he came up and he said, I found it in the Buddhist Vajrayan tradition, the Charya, where the Sadhaka who is usually upper caste, Brahmin or upper caste as of we describe them today. His beloved whom he is seeking is always the lower caste woman, the symbol of Shabari, a tribal woman. <laughs> Don't be the dome woman who are in the crematorium. And that is the urge to be one with you. I said, oh my God. And then we picked them up, Charyas, and of course I danced to them. And um, nobody has ever criticized me for doing this to the great tradition of male composers and poets and um, saying that, oh, how can you do this? There's no question of that. Second thing is that when we say modern dancers or modern I, I fail to understand, I think we are all modern, we are all modern, we are right here. We are contemporary, as contemporary as any contemporary painter or sculptor or writer or poet. The thing about tradition is that if you understand what is tradition, that which means going forward. This has been said time and again, param param, parampara. Tradition is parampara. So when you translate it in your own idiom, it becomes very simple to understand. It is not orthodoxy that I suppose people usually mean. Orthodoxy is rudy. It is tied down in one place, like a like a bull, uh, like a, this poor bell going round and round. You know, tail nikalne ke liye, tail ghani ka bell. Parampara is ever moving. It's it's a fast flowing river. And whether you are with it or you want to stay on the banks or you want to drink a little bit of that is up to you entirely. So tradition is not something to be broken. Tradition is to be understood. Tradition is to be lived if you like or not lived if you like. You have complete freedom. And what uh, Karan Singh Ji was saying, Guru Shishya Parampara, Again, that parampara, no guru. See, the word guru is also very, now there are fashion gurus and cuisine gurus and uh, uh, ad gurus, corporate gurus. So that word guru, of course, is such a, such a grand word. And no guru in our dance music, art traditions would ever say any guru worth his or her salt that you better just stick to what I've told you. In fact, a guru has always said, I've given this to you, Vidya, take it forward. Take it forward. That is the Guru Shishya Parampara that we are used to in this country. And uh, uh, about, then you mentioned, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> you talk about Bibhatsa. 
and then you said there is Shringar and there is Karunya. There are no rasa. Ashta rasa actually. Shantam is no rasa. It was added much later. Because unless there are ripples, there, are, there is no rasa. But you forget hasya. And it's a huge thing in India today that we've forgotten to be light. The lightness of our being. It's not ha 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 slapstick laughter that we are now watching here and there. It's the wit, the humor, the subtlety, and the, 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 the ability to see through things and not be judgmental. Not be judgmental. But yes, you know. Yes, okay. That's how it is. And therefore, it is so wonderful that you can uh, play with your gods and goddesses. Uh, Karan Singh Ji forgot the goddess. He talks always of Nataraj. Nataraj is Nataraj is incomplete without Nateshwari Devi. And <laughs> yes, uh, I think that is the uh, Purusha Parampara, but Purusha is Purusheti Iti Purusha. Not only the male, that which was before everything, that is Purusha. So it is neither about masculine or feminine, but um, the beauty of form of Nataraj and the beauty of form of Devi. And that's what makes for beauty that we see everywhere, whether it is uh, Bipatsa or whether whatever. I'm coming to this uh, Shringar thing. I think uh, Naman and all of us need to visit the tribal and the folk arts. Here we end up only talking about so-called Shastriya, not even classical, that's a Greek word. Shastriya. But Shastra also has all these elements. How we forget our tribal arts? I mean, there are Contrary legends, I'm sorry to say this, that I think very few of us have understood or tried to understand or tried to even go to them. The, the story about Mahisha in the Bhagri community of Gujarat is totally contrary. In fact, Parvati says, I'm bored with you, Shiva, I'm going with Mahisha. And at night she goes and comes back in the morning. And she's taken over Shiva's gold when his jata is open, and Shiva cannot find Mah fight Mahisha because, you know, Samson and Dila are here. He has no bala until Parvati comes back with his gold. Now, this is anti Brahminical tradition. But here I've danced it. And nobody said, Hello, how can you do that? We are going to chop your hair or cut your throat. Nobody said that. Second thing, the folk songs. You talked of all that. Uh, you know, erotica. Oh my God, it's full of erotica. The songs in Bihar and Gujarat and you know, for marriages, for every occasion, they are, I mean, they, they sometimes are so body, B-A-W-D-Y, so body, that, I mean, you, you are shocked. We, the city-bred, intelligent, secular, liberal people, we are shocked very fast. But the real people down there, up there, down there with us. They sing it. Women sing it. Two men. And look at Holi. Holi is the time where they throw not only color, water, down, whatever. And they describe every part of man's body. And they say, hello, what? All kinds of things. So I think we need to, India is a large country. India has so many communities, so many languages. I need not say that. The diversity is mind-boggling even today. I think before we jump into such debates and discussions and discourses, we need to know our country more. Thank you. It's a very tough act to follow such erudite people. Uh, Dr. Karan Singh, we've been hearing absolutely zapped, as it were, for years now, speaking and, uh, on issues of Hinduism deep and after deep understanding. Naman is from my alma mater. I am a JNUite, so I suspect I'm going to get into a little trouble on that count. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so because we are in five minutes. <laughs> and Sonaban, quite the mentor, 
quite the inspiration for all of us. And today I would like to also talk a little bit about her work as I support uh, from her example, her performance, uh, performance graffiti as it were, some of the points that I'd like to make. So being the last speaker has its advantages and several disadvantages. So many wonderful points have been made that I have to pick and choose a few of them to develop and weave into an argument, as is evident. All the writing that I did has no relevance to know what I'm going to speak because I'm trying to weave a new tapestry. Also, I would like to take a moment here to remember with deep fondness, uh, Shantaji, who has, uh, I've often said I have several matrikas who look out for me. And <laughs> Shantaji was one of those matrikas who used to look out for me. So I'm really grateful uh, to Dipayan for doing this and to uh, Suresh-ji for uh, doing it with determination uh, month after month and uh, I had the privilege that I was an accidental participant last time and this is my genuine time that I'm going to be speaking on. So uh, I think one of the biggest problems that we have when we deal with a topic like spirituality and secular uh, in the arts we are looking at very key and uh, words that need a full session or a full day just to describe them. But taking the point that uh, Dr. Karan Singh made about the fact that our arts are linked with religion, uh, have religious roots, and he referred to the evident religious roots with Hinduism, but uh, there are many varieties of Hinduism, so do we have an adequate representation? Let's not talk about that, but with Buddhism, the Ajanta Elora Caves, um, Sonavan even talked about uh, uh, the Charya Giti that she used uh, to establish the point about uh, the Sharbari. Um, Islam, Shabri, sorry. Uh, Islam, the, all your Taranas are actually coming from the Islamic Sufi tradition. And then I cannot but make reference to my own religious uh, faith, which is Sikhism, in which every the entire Guru Granth Sahib, from the beginning to the end, is uh, strung in ragas. They're clearly defined ragas. The name is written, the rag that you have to follow. So there is a very close association. It's also secular, surprisingly, because the Guru Granth Sahib has contributions from uh, saints of the Bhakti tradition. It has contributions of Muslim saints. It has uh, just only six gurus kibani in it, you know. So it's not a six six thing. It's it's a little more secular. And uh, your question that you raise sir, about what about beauty? I would like to ask you a question today. In today's slightly discordant world, in which we are forgetting to laugh, the hasiras is getting a little reduced. Do we have anything other than beauty? Beauty tends to be a little comforting, beauty tends to be a little lulling, beauty tends to be a little feeling at peace when everything may not be at peace. Um, you had raised another question about the Guru Shishya Parampara and you asked uh, Naman whether it was slavish. Uh, slavish. So, so I recall a conversation I had, and then of course he's written that in his book as well, um, Raghava Menon. He talked about the swara, and the guru gives you the technique to reach the right tonality, but you have to light it by your own swarness, your own self. And so, very often in India, we have the tradition of musicians first running away from their homes to join the guru, and after some years, which may be 20 years also, eventually running away from the Guru also and taking little bits and pieces in a sadhukri fashion uh, from other Gurus and enriching and bringing their swanness to their note. Religion and public spaces, you talked about eroticism and censorship, you talked also about maya and empathy and that is really where I take the, my argument to. A safer word than spirituality and secular religion and all that sometimes I think is dharma because that talks about righteousness. It takes out colorations of saffron and green and blue and yellow, whatever else be the colors that we normally associate with, uh, with faiths. 
and it brings us into um, what is the dharma, the righteous, right attitude of an artist? What is the purpose of the artist? Is the purpose of the artist to be destructive for sake of destruction? Is the purpose of the artist to be um, continuing to present an already established faith for, uh, form and follow it religiously? Solomon has explained so beautifully that our arts are paramparas. They keep changing every day, and especially certain forms like Kathak, which are not fixed into items. They allow you like daily ways of changing and taking whatever you think is appropriate and taking it beyond. Um, Sonal Ben herself has done so many pieces which from which are in the frame of say Odissi or Bharatnatyam, but they raise issues. Who can forget her Draupadi, for instance? With that flying hair at the back. It was more contemporary than today's activist women, you know, that sort of thing. I also remember Rani uh, Khanam's not so long ago performance, 2013 performance, which raised issues of Muslim personal law. She raised questions on triple talaq, a burning and hot subject of today in classical dance. So it's not that the potential of asking questions is not there, the potential of taking things beyond is not there, but A, you need a master, B, you need a clarity of thought and a determination that you're concerned. My worry often is, since I've spent my life with dancers, they sometimes get into this comfort level and can spend an entire lifetime of being in a comfort level of not questioning. How can you not question? Do you not live in today's world? How can you... You see, beauty cannot be used as an opiate. I'm not saying religion as an opiate. I mean saying the making of beauty can become an opiate. There is time for everything. There is a time for exploring beauty. There is a time for being lulled into comfort. There is a time of sort of getting an inner wash because of great music through Padiyas and all that. I mean, even today when Vasif hits a note, it's wonderful when the Gundecha brothers sing in tandem, there is no beginning, there is no end, there is no binary, despite two bodies being present there, there is no two-ness at all. But how can you not be concerned? After all, the first piece of poetry, human poetry in India is believed to have emerged out of a moment of Karunya Ras. It is when the Karancha bird is killed. There is a reaction and the first shloka of the Ramayana gets written like that. It's not every faith prioritizes um, compassion. Uh, the Karunya Ras, which is, so we, we call Shringar as Ras Raj, but actually Adi Ras is Karunya Ras. Uh, we have one of the names for Allah as Rahim, Rahmat, you know, so sort of uh, compassion. Sarbad uh, da In Sikhism, every ardas ends with the words Sarbad da It doesn't say bhala for my community, not for the other community. Sarbad <laughs> We as a, as a culture, since we've had a reference to civilizational values, I think we as a culture have been always about embracing everybody. Vasudev Kutumbakam. How can you say Vasudev Kutumbakam if seeing little, what's that boy's name? Um, Alan Kurdi, the body of little three year old Alan Kurdi lying on the beaches of the Mediterranean Sea of seeing the endless Rohingyas with fear in their eyes streaming into India, of Katwa and many other such cases, that Katwa has just shaken us more and sort of we are not being able to leave it from our mind. Hundreds of such cases. How can, what is the dharma of the artist if it is not to respond? Was the scream an attempt to respond? Was not Guernica an attempt to respond? Are these not things that grab you by your jugular and shake you? What is the dharma of the artist is with what is the way I would like to leave today's uh, discussion part. I'm sure we will have a lot of richness in the questions that will follow. So thank you for your attention and open to all questions. Okay. I think <clears throat> moderator has a few privileges. I mean, at the end of the panelist and the keynote speaker, I can 
give my ideas without having them first sent by anyone except to the QAD. Uh, just a few observations, really. Uh, is, is spirituality actually religion? Then how do you talk about uh, sort of the, uh, no, I think you mentioned the Tataranas. You have those, where you have the Islamic Christians coming in, you have Sufism coming in, you have all kinds of things, what are they? Bhakti movement, was it Hindu movement or was it Sikh movement or was it Islamic movement? What was it? So I, I think uh, uh, have, we have to make a distinction between religion and the spirituality. Both are important. But I think at a certain level, religion is personal. Spirituality is not. Spirituality is what actually binds an individual to the other, the society. Just one of the observations that I have to make. Uh, Satyam Shivam Sundaram sir, my interpretation, as I was told when I was growing, is that Satyam is Satyam, the truth. Shivam is eternal. Sundaram is beauty. The Satyam is eternally beautiful. Satyam is a beauty for eternity. So Satyam is not... Yes, sir. No, well, I'm... I'm, I'm this is... Satyam... Therefore, Satyam is not limited by what you see or the physical shape or anything at all. But Satyam is something which is truth, which is beautiful always, as it is. And as they say, the beauty lies in the eyes of the people. Therefore, I don't think we can really talk about the Bhatsa is not relevant. It is relevant. It is part of the society. Uh, we may not see it, but it is there. Tribal folk arts, they are as much a part of our traditions, our parampara, as classicism. In fact, I think this debate between classic and modern is a silly debate, really. It is it is meaningless completely. As you said, we are all modern, we are all contemporaries. I do a festival on a annual basis of the contemporary dances, and it's a pleasure to see those traditional dance forms being uh, developed or being used to create a completely new space on the stage. And they are as good. I think that number when you talk about the visual art forms, basically, sculptures and the paintings and today when I see the sculptures and the paintings in India I don't really can't make a distinction whether this is Indian or this is European somehow when we began the movement towards the arts the new arts in India we became totally Western the performing arts on the stage have continued to retain their Indian identity I think that's a very very strong uh, thing that we see uh, and therefore, it's not a question of, you know, of religion. Religion doesn't validate Bharatnatyam. Religion doesn't validate any performances of the Lord of the state. It is basically what you find in them. And when you actually, you look at a dancer on the stage. At that time, Sonaji, when you do Abhinaya, you are totally submerged in the Abhinaya. You are part of the Abhinaya. I think that is the beauty of it. And what is saying, just to, uh, just to uh, confirm, uh, as a child, when we used to go to the marriage events in our family, etc., we were thrown out of the room <laughs> in the night by the ladies because that was part of the ritual. And once I pretended to sleep and I listened to all that and I could vouch for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Very briefly, it's, it's truncated. There's a lot more to say, but as a moderator, I must respect time. And this is the kind of QA comments. Uh, 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 the time, how much time do we have? Is not six part past eight, another forty minutes? Forty minutes. Forty minutes. Eight thirty. Eight thirty. So the floor is now open for comments, Q and A, anything. There. Open religion. Religion is part of culture. Religion and. Also part of culture, and as we say, social change is part of art. So now, there is what difference between separate, uh, socialism and secularism and social change? Question to Honorable Dr. Tan Singh. What difference between 
secularism and social change. Social change meant. Secularism and social change. Same word. Social change is built to art. Yes. village and you see in Tondaiman areas for instance uh, in Tamil Nadu even today in the villages they they sort of um, have a particular festival where um, they say sorry to Draupadi for the kind of uh, dishonor that was done to her and they have this huge painting of of uh, Turyodhana on it, it almost throughout the way Throughout the village, there is this painting on the floor. And then you have people moving in a kind of a dance. They go to the local temple, and there is a, an icon of Draupadi there. They remove it, and the Draupadi icon has its hair open. And they have an actor, who's a Dharaputu actor, actually a man, dressed as Draupadi. He comes with his hair open. And then, you know, there is a ceremonial kind of a thing where the hair is knotted and said, we are going to avenge this kind of insult done to a woman. Now, I think this is something which is uh, very important in, ter in secular terms. And it's also something which they celebrate as a religion. So where are you going to draw the distinctions and say that these two live so completely away from each other? And also when we are talking of art, I don't know, nobody seems to talk of the fact that really great art, whether it is secular or not, I don't, all art I think has got to be spiritual. Spiritual not in the sense of being religious, but it has to involve the spirit. And then I think it takes the audience to a kind of a space, that's all I can call it, a space that's not available to you in mundane life. You experience that space. You see some great art, you see music which is really great, which moves you as you, I mean, you feel that there is a veena inside you that's playing, you know, because it touches you so deeply. And then there is a kind of an experience which you can't have in everyday life that only comes through the art form. And I've seen this again and again happen and what we call the classical arts. Then I've seen An Ammanur Madhava Chakya perform. I mean, he came an old man of 84 being helped by two people on two sides. He could barely walk onto the stage. And he came and settled down on a stool. And then he just sat there like that. And I said, what is this old man going to do? I don't think he will do anything very much more than just show a little bit of Abhinaya. And suddenly, he looked into that flame. And after a while, all in one motion, he just stood on a stool, all by himself. Till then, here was the man being helped by two people onto the stage. And suddenly, he stood on the stool. And then he started showing Ravana playing with the abode of Shiva. And Parvati absolutely frightened. And the stool was like that. Very little space. He was standing on that for 25 minutes performing. And the whole hall was sitting on the edge of the seat saying, this man is going to die right now. He can't possibly last out, I mean, uh, last after this because it's, it's too much. It's too much for this uh, frail frame. Then after about 25 minutes, when we thought that it wouldn't almost end, you know, the whole thing suddenly came to a stop. And then he sat down. And again, he was a frail old man who was being helped off the stage. Now, what do you call the experience that the audience had? 
I mean, he was not saying something about, he was not trying to moralize, he was not trying to tell you something about society, you have to do this, you have to do that. It was a little bit of myth that he enacted in front of you. But the power of it was so great that it moved people. And they were talking about it for days on end. That is what great art is. And all this talk about religion, about secularism, I think this is all on the surface. Sir, my name is Rashmi Barma and I have a small answer to my understanding. Raja Ravi Barma's painting. This whole crux is the same as we have been discussing today. Because when we look at their painting and now we have seen a picture from them, Rasik, then there are the same. Yes, Rang Rasiya. Rang Rasiya is the correct word. Then I knew that there was so beautiful painting in the world. And they said, Sir, spiritual plus modern, everything he has touched, each and every plus our social reform. So Raja Ravi Varma is one of the answers for all of this, the topic today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other comments or any... I don't see any... Add something? I mean, just... Okay, okay, sure. Uh, it's just a minor comment. Uh, you know, uh, we have seen such great art forms like Madame Mansing, but today's dance, unfortunately, is just gymnastics, which is very sad. <laughs> That's so called modern dance. Uh, this modern dance. Uh, okay, uh, I think, sir, this time you will have the last word. Uh, and, okay, was there some other? Uh, yes. Uh, can we? Uh, well, thank you. Um, very interesting, lot of room for thought. And I think the fact that you said that art is something so moving and so deeply transformative and that it can respond to how can you not, as Ashia said, be provoked by your circumstances? And if the provocation that you have felt is uh, is something that you express with such conviction that it can transport your audience, then you are equally you are answering the other question that you are a vehicle for social change. You are causing a transformation, not through your own. You are acting as a medium through whom the trans you are transporting your audience. And so that responsibility for that artist to be able to do that is, is very much there. And so one then remembers that, well, what do we do with our artists? How can we protect them? How can we look after them such that they can continue to be the powerful mediums that they are? That's a wonderful, wonderful and, and does that actually? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, do they need a very special kind of place to be able to, because a lot of our audiences don't have the courage themselves to live out the lives that, that they expect the artist to be able to communicate. And to have that strength, the courage, to be able to live that out, because your audience doesn't have, they, they vicariously want to enjoy it through you, as you live that out for your, for your reader, for your viewer, whatever it is. And that that does put the artist in a very vulnerable position constantly because you're being preyed upon, as it were, to deliver that. And so that instrument of social change or that instrument of transformation requires that kind of protection. It's something that I think may require a little bit of thinking how and this is not addressed to anyone in particular, but it is carrying forward the argument that uh, uh, Naman just articulated. You know, in the Indian concept with the arts, the responsibility is not that of the artist alone. Only 50% of the cycle of rasa is the responsibility of the artist. The other 50% is the responsibility of the audience. So, what do you see? You take back from a performance what you 
you know, what you deserve to take back. So with what nazar are you seeing the performance? For instance, with one ankh ka thing that a dancer, and Sona Ben's eyes are extremely voluble that way, <laughs> she can make an everybody squirm in their seat because your audience is forced to look into their own lives and see how they have failed womanhood. Secondly, there is the concept of sanchari. So, basically, artist be jhanda leke nahi war karega, social change laega. Like, he doesn't have to hang like Bhagat Singh Ang and things like that. But there are various ways, subtle, not so subtle, but various ways. In a traditional piece, Krishna ni bega ne baro, Krishna come to me. What sanchari do you choose to do is also very important. Are you going to just keep doing the regular sancharis? Uh, you know, of uh, Gajendra, Moksham and things like that. Or are you going to now challenge yourself and say, no, I am going to talk about the about the agrarian distress. Why is the Annadatta farmer becoming the Atmahatyara farmer, you know? You can bring in many things. So Krishna, come to me and help us solve this position. I remember a moment from Naman's body exhibition. It is one of my... It, it is my favorite exhibition of all times that I saw. And you have those lovely Jain images, you know, in, where the space was supposed to be the body uh, and there was no, yeah. And I just stood in front of them riveted and I said, where are India's missing girls? The missing body in there reminded me about, so it's what you, what nazar ke saat aap dekho, where, where have you primed yourself? to be able to see. You take back whatever you see. So uh, that is how the artist alone cannot be the instrument of social change. Even the audience bears a responsibility towards that. So the audience, if you want Bollywood and comfort levels and you know enthusiasm of that, well, you'll get that. Otherwise, come and see the performance and come with that mindset of taking back as much as you can. And finally, sir, this is the point that I wanted to make towards your thing. Social change comes with the first change inside you. It gets reflected out of your heart as well. And artists are meant to be transformative. The first transformation is supposed to come to them. So, here you have come, so you have to receive it. You have to be ready for it. I just say briefly that uh, uh, I think uh, our expectations from the artist and the art sometimes are highly exaggerated. Uh, artists and the art can be a reflection on the society. It will bring to you in that articulate or the eloquent form what perhaps you don't see or you don't want to see. And then you are forced to see when it is actually presented to you either in the shape of a performance and, or anything at all really. But the change, I don't think the artists are responsible to bring the change. Artists can bring it to you, but the change has to be brought in by the society to which everybody is a part, both the artists and the rasikas or the people. The, the change is really the community. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sorry. 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 I was in uh, at the end of my tour in Kampuchea and that was Paul Pot ke baat ki baat hai, the horrible horrors of Paul Pot. Um, I was told that I was the first outsider, the artist anyway, but to, to visit. So I had to visit that I had to see my uncle Bart, otherwise I will not perform. And that was a good blackmail after reaching Phnom Penh. So Hank Samarin was the head of the junta and I sent him a note and two said or three said in performances thing. It was really Phnom Penh at that time, the capital of Kampuchea, um, really frightening. कुछ कुछ ऐसा हवा में था खैर दूसरे दिन हमें हमको रात को मैसेज आया कि सुबह पांच बजे तैयार हो जाइए और एयरपोर्ट जाना है तो जिनको जाना था मेरे साथ वो आए थोड़े बहुत आठ वहाँ पे खड़े थे सूटे पुटे कहा कि बेस्ट ऑफ लाउस बेस्ट ऑफ वेट में बेस्ट ऑफ चाइना मैंने इंडोनेशिया में थाईलैंड � 
So out of the three planes that remained, which were being flown by Russian crew, one plane was released for us. And we went to the uh, same airport and aircraft carriers and all of them were anti-gun and everything. They came and the Buddha heads were rolling in the tall grass and each one of them had this uh, uh, machine gun uh, toting people with us. It was really surreal. My performances were two days ago, and when I was going to the fourth day, when I was going to the fourth day, I was going to the fourth day. That day, the morning of the Royal Palace, Prince Narodham Sinha Sehanu was uh, alive then, and the Royal Palace was the Darbar Hall, the Mandap, Mekong River, and we took it to the Royal Kampuchian Ballet. You invite me to invite you. So I and my art musicians are going to meet in Odissi Bharat Nautim. Dr. Sahib, what can I tell you? Two days ago, we saw in the Angkor Wat Apsaras with the upturned smiles. The mouths are very beautiful. So there are little girls there, they will be 6, 8, 10, 12 maximum years. Very coarse, पिंक धोती हमारे खाती से भी कोर्स एक टिनी टिनी कुछ बेल्सा जूडी एंड एक लिटिल नॉटेड ब्लाउज अब सरा डांस किया हम देखते रह गए उसके बाद लड़के आए करीब तीस एक लड़के फ्रेड कॉलर्स किसी का शर्ट यहाँ फटा हुआ किसी की एक वो स्लीव काटी हुई दे डिड द हनुमान डांस हम देखते रह गए खूब उसके बाद बैठ के वज्रासन में बैठ के जैसे हम लोग हस्त मुद्रा बोलते हैं ये सब उन्होंने अपनी उसमें बताया फिर जो प्रिंसिपल थे टॉल वेरी डिग्निफाइड पर्सन ही ब्रॉट थ्री वन वन लेडी एंड टू मेन एंड इंट्रोड्यूस देम एस दी थ्री टीचर्स आउट ऑफ वन हंड्रेड हु हैड बीन देयर एंड देन ही पॉइंटेड � they are all orphans. And I read the book just in Vietnam before coming to Kampuchea uh, uh, about this uh, Pol Pot and the horrors. And I visited the so called interrogation center. Each one had seen their parents being tortured and killed. And out of hundred teachers, only three were there. Acha, I ye kyo kari hu? Ke jaise Naman ji ne aaj yahan bhashan diya, to Dr. Georg Leshner, my second husband, who was then director of Max Muller Bhavan in Bombay, to Pina Bausch, the idol of icon of uh, modern dance in the world, not only in Germany. Unko bulaya tha, and there were big seminars in Bombay. At that time, Chandra Dekha was not known. She did not come back to dance, 1984. And I had a phone call to me and said, I had a phone call to me, so I had a name of Shanta, Chandra Dekha, Asta, Debu, and I had a name of it. There, I was taken to task by no other than Dr. Leshner himself after I had done a demonstration You don't care about nuclear holocaust. It's all about your gods and goddesses. When is Indian dance going to change? And all that. I listened to that. After that, I went to the committee three and came to the 84. I told him this. I said, according to you then, those young boys and girls should have danced the dance of agony and death and torture. No, they transformed all that into the beauty of movements. Mm. They themselves were transformed. They transformed everyone and everything. So this is our mind. You have to do whatever you want to do. Do not be judgmental. I have to say that, Leela Ji. Because we so easily become judgmental. Mai jaisa kar rahi hu, vaisa aap do nahi kar rahi hu. That is the kind of questions I've raised, which have no place in the world of art. 
कला विद्या उसमें ये प्रश्न नहीं उठता है This is one minute left, so I don't want to say very much except that uh, two outstanding performances that I've seen: Maya Prasadskaya dancing the Swan Lake in the Bolshoi Theatre, Moscow. It's a totally different kind of dance, but the ethereal, the spiritual element is there. And Balasarsuti, the great Balasarsuti, doing Abhinay here in Sampru House. TTK introduced me to her. Me there, I'd never heard of the dance. And she didn't move. She didn't move her body at all. So, Abhinay uh, itself was something good. So, uh, just two points. One is that three times on it, rasa ho, rasa ka hone chahiye. Jab tak rasa ka nahi hoga, to ras ka kaun swad swad kaun lega? You have to have people, and that is where the education of the public and of young people is so important. The point that you made. And I think actually, the show that Leela likes very much. I'll change from the Shaiva to the Vaishnava tradition. इन्होंने मुझे कहा कि आपने स्त्री का वो नहीं लिया वैसे शिवजी नटराज का वन इयरिंग इज फेमिन एंड वन इज बेस्ट बट नंद लेस अर्धनाडेश्वर वुड गो वन स्टेप फॉर फादर एंड नहीं ऑल राइट व्हाटेवर आई स्टैंड करेक्टली नो नो सर तो फिर भगवती का आधा शरीर शिव ऐसा को क्यों क्यों नहीं बोलते � अब जैसे आप बढ़ी कहें मैं इसलिए जब विवाह तो नहीं पढ़ना चाहता हूँ कि किसमें किसको दिए किसको नहीं दिए किसने भी दिए हैं अर्जना अभिष्कर जो है इसे जो मेरे 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 इस यासा पद्मा सरस्ता विपुल कड़ी कड़ी पद्म पत्राय ताक्षी गंभीरा वर्तना भी स्तन भरन विता शुभ्र वस्तोत्तरीय लक्ष्मी दिव्य ही विजेत्री मनीगण कहते हैं इतना आपता ही है मुंबई नित्यम सावत महस्ता मामवस्तु ग्रह है सर्वमांगी Stimulating evening. <laughs> you, now you realize that the discussion actually was not all that really good. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you all. Our next session will be on 8th June. May I request Asif, to, our Vice President, to come up with me. Please, our script. <laughs>